Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our continuing study on Thin Places, Heaven Reimagined. We are in week 18, and I have come to the decision that it's probably time to begin to wind this series down. So maybe another two weeks, three at the most, and we will begin to transition into some other course of study. Along the way, I've had uh, an overwhelming request that I teach a class on Revelation. Well, actually, my dear friend Donna Baker casually mentioned in passing that she might like to have a class on Revelation, so that's really what happened. But hey, it is Donna, so there. My first experience with teaching Revelation is when I was in college down in the Rio Grande Valley, and I had an opportunity to go to a, a little town up northwest of the valley called Rio Grande City and preach for a few Sundays. And the first Sunday I got there, walked in and uh, introduced myself and they said, oh, by the way, the person who preaches also teaches the adult class. Well, that was great, no problem. I was 20 something years old and I knew everything, so prep wasn't a big issue. And I said, what are, we, what are we studying? And they said, well, Revelation. And I said, oh, uh, no problem. And so I taught Revelation that day the way that I had been taught to teach. Uh, we started at the right front of the auditorium, whoever was sitting in the front row, going right to left. And the first person would read a verse. And I would say, what do you think that means? And after giving it serious consideration, the person would say, it means exactly what it says. And I would nod in agreement and say, absolutely right. Next verse, please. And that's how we got through our first study of Revelation. Hopefully I can do um, a little bit more in depth with it this time. We've been talking for 17 weeks now about heaven, showing a lot of video clips of people who tell us that they have died and gone to heaven and come back to report what they've seen. And it's been a beautiful experience. But to be honest and to be fair, there is another side to eternity. And I think that it's only right that we should give it at least some passing consideration. So this morning, we're going to be, for a little while at least, talking about hell. Um, I doubt that there are any small children watching this class unless parents are using this as a way of punishing children for not doing what they were told to do. But in case that there are, I would just like for the parents to know up front that some of this, of course, will be, as it has to be, rather graphic. And you may want to be prepared to discuss this with your small children, or if you're uncomfortable with it, you may want to just maybe have them occupied in some other way. We'll probably be taking maybe uh, 20, 25 minutes this morning before we jump back into the prophets and take a look at Hosea and Jonah. What an interesting character Jonah is. But we want to give a little bit of thought this morning to the subject of hell. If you are an atheist, of course, hell is not an op a problem for you. For that matter, neither is heaven. Uh, you are of the mind that when you die, it's all over and done. There's nothing of reward or nothing of punishment, and so hell is not a problem for you. If you have grown up in the Catholic tradition, you're probably familiar with the, the doctrine of purgatory. Purgatory is uh, a halfway place, I guess the best I understand it, something between heaven and hell when a person dies, depending on what kind of a life they lived here on earth, they can go into a place of purgatory 
and there, through some process, they're able to atone for their sins and then can either be prayed out or bought out or earn their way out of purgatory into heaven. This uh, has very little scriptural basis to it. There are some obscure passages that have been referred as indicating this, but nothing of any substance. However, it did serve the Catholic Church very, very well during the medieval period because they were able to sell penance so that a person, by paying money, could shorten their time in purgatory, and that penance money was used to fund a lot of the building in Rome, in particular St. Peter's Cathedral, so it was very, very profitable. And it was one of the things, the, the abuses, that led to the Reformation period. There are also those who are referred to as universalists. They believe in universal salvation. They simply conclude that a loving God could never send anybody to hell, and therefore everyone will, uh, at least eventually, be saved, and perhaps immediately be saved. And that's certainly a comforting doctrine, one that uh, we would all like to agree with. It has some problems, of course. How does God make right the wrongs of this world? How does a person like Hitler or Pol Pot or a dozen other terrible, terrible despots that we could refer to, finally find the justice of God if everyone is saved. And of course there's not any very substantial scripture that one can even contort to come up with that conclusion. But it's very comforting to think that it doesn't really matter what I do here on earth, because God is so loving, he's going to make sure that I'm okay when I die. Another somewhat prominent teaching is the idea that there is indeed an eternal heaven, a home of abode, abode a place of abode for, for the righteous, for those who are Jesus followers and God lovers. But for those who do not qualify for heaven, there is simply annihilation. When they die, there might be some temporary accounting for their life or not, but in any event, they are not faced with an eternity of punishment. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses are both proponents of this idea. We have several of our rather prominent Church of Christ uh, theologians who have proposed this, who teach this and believe this. Um, Homer Haley, uh, former president of ACU. Um, Edward Fudge, that many of you are probably familiar with. Leroy Garrett. Um, my friend Al Maxey, and these are all very intelligent, highly respected gentlemen who have done a lifetime of study. And they look at scriptures and interpret them in such a way that they can account for God rewarding the just, but not condemning those who are unworthy of heaven or those who God has not called into heaven to face an eternity of damnation. I have read their books. Uh, I understand the logic that they apply to a number of passages. Um, it would be very comforting to think that they are right. And maybe they are. But there are some problems with that also. When we come to the Bible and just read it at face value, 
without doing the deep exegesis that the annihilists bring to it. The Bible speaks frequently, especially the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament, but not prominently. But when you come to the New Testament, all eight of our gospel writers, our epistle writers, the authors of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James, and Jude, all make references to this place of damnation to hell. Perhaps more revealing even than that is that as Jesus' words are presented in the four Gospels, no one talks about hell as much, as frequently, as severely as does Jesus himself. So, I think we have to take it pretty seriously. While universalism and, and nihilism and purgatory are, are, are lovely ideas, I'm not yet convinced that it's a safe course to conclude that that's what Jesus is telling us. It would be great if one or all of them truly were scriptural. Well, this morning I have about three little short clips for you. And uh, the first one, um, Doug McDaniel put me in touch with this writer, uh, Dr. Mars, Maurice Rawlings. Dr. Rawlings was a cardiologist. He died in 2010. And he became very interested in near-death experiences and particularly in hellish experiences uh, back in uh, the late 20th century and when he was in the process of caring for a man who was having a heart attack. And, and we're going to listen to the opening statement of his book as he describes that to us. Dr. Rawlings was a, a prominent physician. Um, he was the personal physician to uh, President Dwight Eisenhower, uh, the physician to the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the time of Eisenhower's presidency. And he's written well, four or five books on the near-death experience, and he's probably spent more time on the hellish aspects of those having that experience than, than most of the other writers that I have read have done. So let's listen now to just this very short two-minute clip of the kind of the opening remarks that introduce us to what brought Dr. Rawlings into his interest in studying this phenomenon. I didn't believe in God, let alone an afterlife. But that belief quickly changed one evening in 1977. I was monitoring a patient of mine, a guy aged 40, whilst he carried out an ECG stress test. There and then, in my office, he had a cardiac arrest and dropped dead to the floor. Three nurses rushed in and began CPR, whilst I started external heart massage, but it wouldn't maintain its own beat. I had to insert a pacemaker wire down through the large vein. The patient began coming to, but whenever I reached for instruments or interrupted chest compressions, he would lose consciousness again, stop breathing, and die one more time. But the terrifying thing was this. Each time he came around and began respiration, he would scream I'm in hell! I'm in and hell. plead with me not to quit. This literally scared the hell out of me. Every time I'd quit, I was sending him back there. He looked petrified. After this happened a few times, I dismissed his complaint and told him to keep his hell to himself until I was finished fitting the pacemaker. But the man was beyond serious. How do I stay out of hell? Pray for me. Pray for him? I thought. I was a doctor, not a preacher. Pray for me. He repeated. It was a dying man's request. As I continued working, 
I took my mind back to Sunday school and had the man repeat a prayer asking Jesus to save him and turn his life around. It wasn't complicated. And with that, his condition stabilized. I asked the patient a couple of days later to explain what he saw in hell, but he remembered nothing as if it was wiped from his memory. The whole experience changed everything I ever believed. One of the questions that I frequently get is, why do we not have more of the hellish near-death experiences in our literature and, and in our uh, conversation? And I think it, there are several reasons for that. Not, it's not that they don't occur as frequently or, or even more frequently for all I know. But people who have these experiences, number one, are very embarrassed about it. I would be, wouldn't you, to think that I had died and gone to hell. Uh, they don't want to be shamed. They don't want to be thought crazy. They don't want to share that kind of an experience with, with anyone. But Dr. Rawlings also believes and has demonstrated through his experience that people who have these experiences very quickly seem to be able to completely blot it out of their remembrance. The instance that he talked about in the short clip a while ago, the man that he exp had had this experience, after he was recovered in a matter of a day or two, Dr. Rawlings came back to him and, and asked him to describe what it was he saw when he was having this hellish experience. And the gentleman was unable to remember anything whatsoever about it. The memory was completely blotted out. And Dr. Rawlings says, ask other patients who have had near-death experience, his own patients most frequently, and Generally, if he asks them immediately after the event, he can get a description from them. But if he comes back and asks them in a matter of days, that memory is completely gone. So it may be that the experience is just so, so terrible that most people would simply not be able to keep it in their memory. How many people experience near-death uh, near-death events that are of a hellish nature. We don't really know for sure. Uh, some of the large studies have reported that of the ones that are reported to them, as many as 20% seem to be of the very unpleasant nature. That's not to say that 20% of all NDEs are hellish and the other 80% the, the other are all of a heavenly nature. It's just to say that that's the way that, that the reporting goes. So we know that they are much more prominent, much more common than perhaps we might uh, be led to believe. Well, I want you to uh, see a little short clip now with Dr. Weiss. Dr. Weiss is a, a Christian, has always been a Christian. Uh, he's still alive. He lives out in uh, California. But back in, I believe, 1998, he got up in the middle of the night to get a glass of water and had what he describes as an out-of-body experience, what he calls a vision. There was not a near-death event. There was not injury or trauma. It was purely a vision, he believes, given to him by God to enable him to come back and to describe what he saw in hell and to use that experience to convince others that they don't want to go there. Now you can take this for whatever it's worth. Um, maybe you'll just brush it off as, hey, he had something bad to eat at night and had a nightmare. But I chose this even though there are a number of videos of people who did have near-death experiences and have come back to talk about it and record it. But I chose this because Bill brings everything 
that he saw and experienced back to Scripture. So I thought you might find that interesting as well. So let's take a minute and watch Bill. On November 23rd, 1998, I had an experience that truly changed my life. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe my experience. What matters is that you check out what the Word of God has to say about hell and avoid it just the same. This was not a near-death experience. This was actually an out-of-body experience that would be classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. Now, my wife and I had attended a prayer meeting every Sunday night. We came home from this prayer meeting, went to bed like any other normal night. Now, I had never studied the topic of hell at this point. I have never gone to dark movies. I've never drank, I've never taken drugs, and I never had a vision before. And I got up at three o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water, and suddenly I was pulled out of my body, like being drawn up out of your body. And I found myself falling through the air, down this long tunnel, and it was getting hotter and hotter. And then I landed on a stone floor in an actual prison cell in hell. Rough hewn stone walls, bars, filthy, stinking, dirty prison cell, but like a dungeon. And I wondered, how did I get here? Why am I here? I was fully awake and cognizant. I looked up and I saw these two enormous beasts in the cell, these demons, reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long, and they were pacing in the cell like a vicious, caged animal, and they had the most ferocious demeanor about them. They had an extreme hatred for God. They were blaspheming and cursing God, and then they had this hatred they directed towards me. The one picked me up, threw me into the wall of this prison cell. I hit the wall. I felt like bones had broken. Even though a spirit doesn't have bones, it felt that way. I collapsed on the floor, and I wondered how could I be alive through this? The other demon picked me up, dug his claws into my chest, and just tore the flesh open. I couldn't believe I was surviving this. How could I be alive through this? I noticed I had a body. Remember Luke 16, he wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak and so forth. But this body withstands the torments. And I noticed though, there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. But Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And there's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for you. Now about this time it went dark. I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see. But then he withdrew his light and it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. I mean, you could not see the hand in front of your face. While I was taken out of this prison cell, I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire that was actually about a mile across with flames raging high up in this open cavern. And this is where I could first see people. There were thousands of people inside this pit screaming and burning. It was so horrendous to see a person on fire. They just looked like skeletons. And the screams were so loud and deafening. You want to get away from the screams, but you can't. Now, I understood I was down deep in the earth. I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. And I understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. But there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Any area is far worse than you can imagine. I wanted to talk to a person, but you're kept isolated and alone for all eternity. You never, ever get to be with people. For all eternity, you're kept by yourself. You know, I thought about my wife up on the earth and I understood I'll never get to say goodbye to her. You don't realize how tormenting of a thought that is. You know, I'll never get to be with my wife, enjoy her, hold her, and uh, to not have any finality with your loved ones is extremely tormenting that for all eternity, she'll never know that I still exist, that I'm down deep in the earth. You know, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist. And I just missed her so much, I wanted to be with her so much. And the stench in hell is so foul and putrid, the worst, like the worst open sewer you can ever imagine. And the demons themselves have a disgusting foul odor to them and the smell of burning sulfur. So you have to fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen. You're, you don't ever get to go to sleep. You're completely exhausted and you never ever get to go to sleep. You're hungry, you never get to eat. You're thirsty. Remember the rich man in Luke 16 wanted one drop of water to cool his tongue. Well, you never get that drop of water. The fear level that you experience in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. And I know something about fear. 
I was attacked by a 10-foot tiger shark pulled down under the water. Well, that fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. I saw maggots crawling all over everything and snakes, demons that were only two and three feet tall, uh, some were larger, twisted, deformed, grotesque. When I was looking at all this horror, something began lifting me up this dark tunnel. And then suddenly this bright light appeared. I knew immediately who it was. And I just called out his name. I said, Jesus. He said, I am. When he said that, I went out. I passed out and I don't know if I died, but he touched me when I came to, it was at his feet that I realized that if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. Man, I was so grateful for the cross. I just want to thank him over and over and over. I didn't want to ask him any questions, but thoughts started coming to my mind and he would answer my thoughts. And there was eight different things that he answered for me, but I'm just going to share two of them with you. One is I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. The second thing was uh, the hopelessness. You see, God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. Many scriptures in the Bible that point that out, but he hid it from me for this reason. You see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't realize, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here. But as an unsaved person, he wanted me to experience what they feel hopelessness and you don't know what it's like to be absolutely hopeless for all eternity you understand you're never ever going to get out of this place there's not going to be anybody come rescue you you'll never get out that's the worst part of hell understanding you're never going to get out you know the most important aspect of this vision that jesus shared with me was a piece of his heart he allowed me to feel a little bit of what he feels the anguish he feels for a soul going into hell. The great love he has for people. It was so overwhelming, I couldn't even bear to stand to feel even a piece of it. But Ephesians 3.19 said, his love passes knowledge. But the reason hell is so horrible is because it's a place absent from God's goodness and his attributes. You know, all good comes from God, James 1.17 states. And he withdrew his goodness because it was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for man. But if man rejects Jesus, there is no other place for him to go. Please hear me. You do not want to experience hell for even one minute, much less than an eternity. But one second after you die, it'll be too late. You will not get a second chance. Because God loves us, he gives us a free will to choose. Please investigate the scriptures for yourself so you can find the truth and avoid this place at all costs. This last little clip is an event where Bill and Don Piper, you remember Don Piper, he's our local person uh, of interest who has experienced a uh, near-death experience. Well, he doesn't call it a near-death experience. He, he just died. He was dead for 90 minutes and wrote the book, 90 Minutes in Heaven. And he and Bill are on a conference together, and um, I have taken just a couple of short clips out of a very long uh, interview that they ex had at this particular case in uh, Santa Fe uh, Hills, Santa Fe Hills, California. And I, I'm bringing this today because Don refers to the Santa Fe shooting here south of Houston and also I think Bill has some important things to say about um, what happens to those who have never heard the name of Jesus. If you're like me you've given that a lot of thought also and as I've taught Romans of course I'm familiar with Paul in Romans 1, first of all, declaring that all people are guilty before God. And then he has this little caveat, it seems to me, about people who have not heard of Jesus, but who, because of creation, have the capability of knowing about God, and they become somewhat of a law unto themselves. 
And Bill will expound on that a little bit. So listen to him in terms of that. Thank you, Don Piper. Honored. Thank We're glad you. to be here. Very honored. Thank Very you. Honored. Both of you at one yeah. time. Wow. This, these are the only times that we get together. Wow. You know, he, he lives here in Southern California. I live in Houston. So we have to have things like this to even see each other. As we're traveling. So we love doing this, and thank you for letting us come. We're yes, honored. absolutely. We and how long have it. you guys known each other? I don't know how long, Bill. Uh, let's see, we've been doing this about, I don't know, 10 years? 10 years, I would think, yeah. Ten I think years. we met, did we meet, did we meet in the green room at, uh, at uh, TBN? Oh. Yes. Yeah, TBN. I think that's where we met the first time. Right. Uh, because exactly, we were doing heaven and hell. I got the good part, oh. he got the hell, and... Um, <laughs> We've been doing it. God likes him better, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I had to get him hit by a truck to do it. <laughs> I wouldn't want that. For yeah. Sure. See. Hey, one of these days, you may pick up the paper if they have papers. You you may hear, you may hear that guy that wrote that book, Ninety Minutes in Heaven. He died. Don't believe that. I, I, when you're reading that, I'll be more alive than I ever was when I was here. Some really horrific tragedies. I, I was in my church just not that many weeks ago, right after somebody went into a school south of us in a place called Santa Fe, Texas, and killed a bunch of students and teachers. Oh, it, was, it was a horrific experience. In my church, several of those teachers came to church. But these, these people were there, and they were looking for comfort. They were looking for solace after a horrific thing. And we talked about heaven. And some of these were close friends of the ones that had been murdered. And I said to them, holding their hand, I'm so sorry for your temporary separation from your loved ones. It's real, but it won't last. And, and somehow that really connects with people because we do miss the ones we love. We've all been to funerals. And we've all, if there was a casket, passed by. And, 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 and we've all been through that. If we haven't, we will. As you know, the death rate here is 100%. We, we feel it, and we're wondering, is, what is, is there something? Where is she? Where is he? And, and the truth is, if they are followers of Jesus, authentically, they are not here. They're absent from the body. They're present with the Lord. They're having the best time. And if you're a follower of Jesus, they know you're coming. Bill, another question is, sometimes people say, well, what about those people that I live in the jungle in some random place and they didn't hear what happens to them? Uh, Two-part answer to that. Yeah. Uh, the people uh, in the remote area that never heard the gospel, they are accountable, number one, because Romans 1 says that because of creation, God holds man accountable. Wow. The evidence of design is everywhere. You look at the human body, how remarkable it's made, plant life, the animal kingdom, the universe, the, the stars and planets are all in order and so forth. So God has placed creation, and so that points to a creator. So if that person in the jungle just has an ounce of humility and said, who made all this design? There's design everywhere. It's evident there has to be a God that designed all this. Mm -hmm. So that points to a designer. So God will find a way to get through that person if they just show that little ounce of humility. He will find a way to get through to them by, by either... He, uh, he gives us a conscience, Romans 2.15 and John 8.9 says he gives us a conscience to know right from wrong, good and evil. So he's placed that in man automatically to know to search for a God. He's put eternity in man's heart, Ecclesiastes 3.11. Uh, he gives us a Bible, the written word. He put in writing how to get to heaven and how to stay to hell. He gives us missionaries that are sent around the world that he can get a missionary to that person. Yeah. Uh, or it's CD or DVD or uh, internet and so forth. Also, there's a scripture in Job 33 that says he even gives man dreams and visions to keep back his soul from the pit. So he will give that man, like I said, if he just calls out and says, God, who are you? He'll give him a dream or a vision. But there's also quickly there's scripture that, that support that man is accountable because 1 John 5, 19 says the whole world lies in wickedness. All of us lie in wickedness. And it says in Psalms 9 and 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Yeah. So we got a problem. Everybody's going to go to hell because we're all lying in wickedness. Yeah. And 1 John 4, 3 says, every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Mm -hmm. Every spirit. And then in Acts 17, 30, it says, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Mm -hmm. 
So all men everywhere need to repent, like Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. Mm -hmm. So we are required to repent, receive Jesus, no matter where you're at, but God is just. That person will not be in hell unjustly. God will find a way to get to that man if they just show that little bit of humility. But if we really understood how severe hell is and how important this decision is, we would take more opportunity to share with people the gospel. Not in a condemning way, but in a loving way to get across the word of God and tell them the good news about heaven. But and he shared with me a piece of his heart, how much he loves people. And I couldn't even bear to stand a piece of the love he has for people. He allowed me to feel that because Ephesians 3.19 says his love passes knowledge. And he loves people far more than you are able to even conceive. And he wept when he saw people fall into hell. Mm -hmm. But he said, you go and tell them. Point them to the scriptures. See, I'm just a signpost. The point of the scriptures. They don't have to believe my experience. Believe the word of God and avoid hell and go to heaven where Don's been. And I tell you, God loves every single person. Okay, so that's what we're going to cover in the way of hell unless... We find it necessary because of your questions and comments to, to come back to it before we finish our classes in this series. But uh, it's too important to ignore. And uh, it's, it's just uh, too frightening not to pay attention to. So now let us jump back into the prophets for just a little while. I want to look at Hosea. You know, we've had several examples already of how God has used acting drama, dramatizations to make his point. We, we had Jeremiah last week with the loincloth, and we had uh, Ezekiel with the valley of dry bones. But in the case of Hosea, God actually uses a man's life to make a point to be a metaphor, if you will, to enable Hosea to have the clear understanding of what God is telling him to tell the Israelites. So we pick up the story of Hosea with these words. The Lord gave this message to Hosea, the son of Beri, during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. You know, of course, that we began with a united kingdom that split with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and now Hosea is prophesying to and about the northern kingdom, the kingdom of the ten tribes, the tribes that will be conquered by Assyria and scattered. So that's the the uh, foundation of this particular book. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. Now, that seems a very odd thing that God would instruct one of his prophets to do. But that's what he tells Hosea to do. Go find a prostitute, take her out of her lifestyle of prostitution, give her a home, give her a name, and give her children. And Hosea does that. God says this will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Dibalaam, and she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. And the Lord said, Name the child Jezreel, for I am about to punish King Jehu's dynasty to avenge the murders he committed at Jezreel. In fact, I will bring an end to Israel's independence. I will break its military power in the Jezreel Valley. We talked about Jezreel a little bit last week. It's the valley that runs between Megiddo and Nazareth, the valley that's called Armageddon in Revelation. And so the first child born to Hosea and Gomer is named Jezreel. 
Soon Gomer became pregnant again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to Hosea, Name your daughter Lo Ruhama, which means not loved. For I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them. Now, brothers and sisters, how many of you, if you had a beautiful little girl, would name her not loved? What a burden to have to carry through her life. Everybody who looked at her and called her by name would call her, your parents don't love you. How traumatic would that be for that young sweet girl? But I will show love to the people of Judah. I will free them from their enemies, not with weapons and armies or horses and chariots, but my power as the Lord their God. After Gomer had weaned Lo Ruhamah, she again became pregnant and gave birth to a second son. This is three children now. And the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, not my people. For Israel is not my people, and I am not their God. That, that would be almost like giving one of your children the name bastard to be blunt not my people how sad then the Lord said to me go love your wife again even though she commits adultery with another lover so Hosea has taken Gomer out of prostitution, given her home, given her a name, given her three sons, and she has repaid him by going back into prostitution. So instead of throwing up his hands and saying, I did my best, I tried, I did everything right, I did everything I knew to do, the Lord tells him, go bring her back. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. So I bought her back for 15 pieces, 15 shekels of silver, and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Then I said to her, you must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone, not even with me. Now we know that Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver is generally referred to as the price of a slave. And if we take the value of five bushels of barley and a measure of wine and add that to 15 pieces of silver, we come up again with approximate value of 30 pieces of silver that Hosea is using to buy Gomer back. And this shows that Israel will go a long time without a king or prince and without sacrifices, sacred pillars, priests, or even idols. But afterward, the Lord will return and devote themselves, the people will return and devote themselves to the Lord their God and to David's descendants, their king, in the last days. In the last days, they will tremble in awe of the Lord and of his goodness. Well, we have brought ourselves through Hosea. We have one prophet in the Old Testament that we want yet to look at, and we'll do that, Lord willing, next week with the prophet Jonah. And then we will move directly into the New Testament, and look at thin places we find there. Of course, the ultimate thin place in all of the Bible is that period of time for some 33, 34 years when God became flesh and dwelt among us. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a wonderful, God-blessed week.